Wow, worship team, that was awesome. Are you ready to hear the word of the Lord? Because it takes a willing heart and an open heart to hear the word of God. Scripture says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is speaking. This morning as I am talking, the Spirit of God is going to talk to you. Some of the words I'm going to say, he's going to enlighten it in your heart. There's going to be words and thoughts that come into your mind by his spirit, things that I didn't say. Because that's how God works. God speaks to his children. Scripture says if we are his sheep, we know his voice. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to break the bread of life. I pray that as I speak this morning, that it would not be my words, but your words. And that our ears would be open to hear and our hearts open to receive. And Lord, that you would be glorified in all that is said and done. In Jesus' name, amen. Several weeks back, I preached a message on the precious blood. I'm going to continue with that thought, the precious blood. And I thought it was very interesting this morning, the worship team singing about the blood. The only thing that can make you white as snow is the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19 says, For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Revelations 12, 11 says, They triumphed over him, speaking of the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from it. I want to review a little bit for you and for those that may not have been here. The last time we talked about this, we said, number one, God requires the shedding of blood for sin. There's no other thing that will take care of sin. Hebrews 9.22 says that. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's how horrible, that's how ugly sin is. It's only the shedding of blood. And only Christ's blood cleanses us from sin. Everything that happened in the Old Testament with all the sacrifices and that, remember we talked about, we quite don't understand that culture because we weren't raised going to the temple and watching animals be sacrificed for our sin. So that concept of sacrificial lambs, sacrificing animals, not necessarily in our culture. But it was an ugly thing. Again, reminding the people of Israel that how ugly their sin was. But it was only a covering. And it only pointed toward who? Jesus Christ. Pointed towards him when he was going to come. We talked about the sinner must be covered with the blood. First Peter chapter 1 verse 2 says that we are sprinkled with his blood. Each one of you that has accepted Jesus Christ right now, spiritually, you have the blood of Jesus Christ upon you. That when the father looks down, he sees his son's blood and he sees you. Mm, and that blood gives us a lot of benefits, church. Lots of benefits. We're seated with him in heavenly places because of it. We have positions in Christ, gifts, anointing, the Father's acceptance. No rejection there. We learned that God provides a sacrifice. We talked about Abraham when God told him, offer up Isaac. And Abraham didn't play around. Next day, he got up and he took off, went to Mount Moriah, which is, they believe, the same mountain which Christ was crucified on. And he went up the mountain, built the altar. His son said, hey, Dad, we got the fire. 
We got the wood, but we don't have the sacrifice. And what was Abraham's response? The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. And by faith, he raised his hand. He was going to strike his son dead. And the angel of the Lord stopped him. Because God seen his heart. He seen his faith. And the only reason Abraham had faith to do that is because he believed in the promise of God and he didn't doubt because God said, through this boy, through your son, all the world's going to be blessed. The offspring is like the sand of the sea and the stars in the sky. He held on to that promise because he believed even if I strike him dead, though it was never experienced before, God could raise him from the dead. Abraham had faith, resurrection faith. And because of that, covenant was made and God could send his son into the world to die for us. The Lord will provide. The ram was there. God provided it. I I want to say this again because I, I said it last time. You know, that ram was monkeying around probably at the bottom of the mountain and God moved him up the mountain a little bit and moved him over here a little bit and just at the right time he got him in that place where he made that little leaf and that bush look really nice and he reached his head in there and he got stuck. In your life, God sees your future. Provision is seeing the future. Provision. At the right time, the right place, you will receive what God has for you. Because he is the God of provision. God provides as a sacrifice. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. God covers the sinner with his blood. Adam and Eve, we learned about how when they sinned, remember they tried to make the fig leaves cover themselves with leaves, and God actually killed animals and covered them with the skins of animals. Remember, this is the first time they've seen that. Okay? Death. They've never seen it before. You and I are accustomed to watching it on TV over and over again. But for them, that was the first time. God brings judgment upon the sacrifice we learned. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. I don't know about you, I got a lot of sins in my life. I mean, I've done a lot of bad things, right? All of them. All of mine, all of yours, all of them. Christ bore on the cross. Not one did he miss. Not one escaped him. That's why it's such a shame for people not to accept what Christ has done. That's why it's a tragedy. That's why... If they never accept Christ, they wind up in hell. It's not God's fault. Didn't have to be that way. So this morning we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 4. We're going to talk about Cain and Abel. Jude chapter 1 verse 11. I'm going to read this. And my heart's a little heavy this morning, but we're going to talk about. It says, Woe to them, in Jude 1.11, they have taken the way of Cain, they have rushed for profit into Balaam's error, and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Three different things Jude talks about here. The way of Cain, Balaam's error. Now, Balaam, if you don't know your Old Testament, Balaam was a prophet that was hired to curse Israel. And the people that hired him said, I can't do it. They're blessed. Matter of fact, he's the one that was so stubborn trying to do it. Remember the donkey spoke to him? God can speak to you in many ways, amen? Wouldn't that be kind of weird? Your your dog says, hey, straighten up. But that shows the grace of God. Even in the Old Testament, working with people, trying to get people to change their ways. And Balaam was all about this. Money is what changed his mind. Enough of it, he figured out a way to get Israel to fall into sin. Korah's rebellion is, they rose up against Moses. And they thought they were the anointed ones. 
Actually, the earth opened up and swallowed them. Okay? So they chose that way of rebellion. He chose, Balaam chose the way of rebellion against God because he knew he wasn't supposed to curse them, but he found a way to get Israel into sin. And Cain, the way of Cain, we're going to talk about this morning. Genesis 4 says, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she being pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, some people think of this. This is not long after the fall. The promise of the fall was what? That her offspring would crush the serpent's head. Now, she doesn't know, but can you imagine her? Her firstborn probably thinking, this is the one that God's going to fulfill his promise through. That's natural as a mother, right? I would think that. So there's high hopes there. Now Abel, the younger brother, kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought forth some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering... He did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry in his face downcast. Okay. So we have a situation here. Again, sacrifice is taking place. Offerings unto the Lord. And Cain, he's a tiller. He's a farmer, man. He's got it down. He, he's producing crops. He works the soil. Abel, he's a young man. He's a guy who's got animals. He's more like, a, you know, beef herder or sheep herder, cattle, his business. But what does God require for an offering? Blood. Do plants give blood? No. Now, when you look here at Cain, and there's something we got to look at here, you know, they weren't, these weren't young guys, these weren't teenagers, Cain and Abel. They were men already. Cain actually had a wife. We don't know if Abel had a wife. But they were men already. They were growing up. And they had been taught what sacrifices were about and how they were to be made. How do I know that? Because in Hebrews 11, 4, it says, By faith, Abel bought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering, and by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. How does faith come? Faith comes by what? Hearing, and hearing the what? The Word of God. So in order for Abel to have faith in what he was doing, he was taught God's way by mom and dad. And so was Cain. So you come to a situation here in the church, because the church was them, it was, you know, it was the beginning of humanity. The belief in God, they were taught about sacrifice and how to do it. And the brother Cain, the older brother, says, you know what? I'm going to do my own thing. The way of Cain is humanism. You and I fight against it every day. It's the choice to say, do I do it God's way or my way? The way of Cain. And what's sad about this story is that Cain knew better. He knew better. But yet he chose his own way. Now, why was he downcast? Why was he upset? How, how do we know that God didn't, you know, there was no favor on his offering? It's kind of interesting Several times in the Old Testament, it gives you some pictures of what happened at the altar. Literally, the fire would come from heaven and consume it. That was a sign that, hey, God accepted it. Right? So more than likely, this was probably what happened here, where the Lord, there was no fire that came on his plants, his fruit. And Abel's was consumed by God. And it's kind of interesting when you look at the story here in verse 6, the Lord has a conversation with him. Now, I don't know, you know, there's times where God would walk among people. We knew that he was there in the garden with Adam and Eve. 
I don't know. It sounds like he actually appeared to them even after. Because when you read the conversation in verse 6, it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So you've got God intervening here in a person's life. A person who has said, I'm doing it my way. I've been taught this, but I really don't care. This is the way I think it would be. I work hard. I planted this crop. This is the work of my hands. This is what I want to give to you, God. I don't care about the animal sacrifices. And it could be, too, that this happened before. He probably thought to himself, you know, why should I have to go to my brother and buy something? See how the enemy works? He starts out with little things, and then it builds. See, you know, I can do it my way. It's okay. I know God said not to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Sin crouching at the door, all of a sudden consumes him. Then you know the story. Now, this blows my mind because when I think about this, remember, this is first time everything. He literally plots. Hey, Abel, let's go out to the field. We're not talking about generations of sin. We're not talking about generations of people living. We're talking out of the gate, first out of the gate. That shows how evil the sinful nature is. That shows how evil lives in us. And we don't even realize it. That's how bad the fallen nature is. That's how much more we need Jesus Christ and his blood in our lives. Amen? Because we cannot overcome it. He did it for us. That's how we overcome it. So he goes out in the field and he kills his brother. What a horrible thing. First time ever, it's not like somebody's mad, you know, hey, you're sleeping with my wife and he kills somebody. No, his brother. And then what does God do? God banishes him. Banish him, it's like a spiritual, it's like going to hell. It's like you're cut off, you no longer have contact. It's a spiritual separation in his life. And all because Cain didn't like the idea of a blood sacrifice. He didn't like the idea of doing it God's way. Now, it wasn't due to ignorance or his, you know, not knowing. It was a direct rejection of divine revelation. He knew. He actually openly flaunted God's method and mocked his word. There's people that do that. You know that. There's people that have come into the body of Christ who have been saved who have been touched by him, who have been cleansed by him, who have walked with him, and they turn their back on God later in life for whatever reasons, and they come to the point where they literally mock God and say things that are horrendous. Now, I, I'm bringing this up this morning because you know what? Young people, all of us, we need to be aware. We need to be aware of people that we know we need to be aware of ministries, whatever it might be. If they're going the way of Cain, you need to back off from them. Big time. Now, God does give grace. He gave grace to Cain. He intervened. He tried to get him to change his mind. But he went his way. And that's sad. The fallen nature is very dark. 
Another thought here. The first murder is due to religion. The first murder is due to religion. Revolved around God. Didn't revolve around anything. It revolved around whether we're going to do it God's way or not. Oh, how many people have died for Christ because they did it God's way and the others didn't want God's way. The persecution that's come against the church because people have stood up and said, you know what? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in his shed blood. I believe in his forgiveness. I believe in his spirit. I believe in all the word of God. You know, just because somebody says, well, the word of God isn't true, doesn't change a thing. It's still true. Are you with me? This book, this word has been through so much through generations and generations, but yet here it is. How arrogant some people are to say that God's word is not true, There's, it's false, it doesn't really make a difference, there's many ways to heaven, there are all kinds of craziness. How arrogant is that? You haven't been around for thousands of years. This book, there's a great, um, Lee Strobel, he wrote a book and he actually made a, a, a film, I think, A Case for Christ. Yeah. He was a New York Times um, investigative reporter. His wife got saved. <laughs> and he was like, what is going on with this woman? You know, he thought, well, that's ah, just a little thing. He said, and of course, he was an investigative reporter, so he decided, you know, I'm going to investigate what she believes in. And as he began going through it, step by step by step, you know, even like, like take the fact that no other religion claims the resurrection. Not one. Buddha, Muhammad, they all be dead. Okay? Jesus Christ is the only one that has risen from the grave. And you know what? Historical fact. Over 500 were there when he ascended into heaven. 120 in the upper room were waiting, you know, for the promise. Nobody has ever said or proven that he didn't raise from the dead. Why do you think the Jewish people hired the Roman soldiers to stand guard at the tomb? Because they said themselves, they said this guy was going to rise from the dead, so we want to make sure nobody takes his body. Well, nobody took his body. He rose from the dead. But how arrogant some people think they are. Have mercy on us. That's the darkness in us. You know, and especially after tasting the goodness of God. You have hurt in your life. You have things going on in your life. Let God take care of it, okay? Don't let it fester. Don't let it be like Cain. That's right. Submit to him. Even though you don't understand it. I don't understand everything. Man, I'm going to get to heaven and say, you know what? I don't know why this, this, and this and seemed jacked up to me, but still I trust you. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. Like Job. My gosh. You imagine, we have no clue. But, you know, we go through our little trials, but Job, his trials. But what did he say? Though he slay me, I will trust him. Yeah, bad things come into our life. Bad things happen. But God's our source. Amen. Christ is our source. Never let that go. Because when you let that go, that's the way of Cain. You begin to bitter and sour and walk away from God. We really, really need to guard our hearts. And we don't look, I don't look down on people who've gone back, you know, backslidden. Don't ever look down on them. 
because you're one step away. The same darkness that got them could get you if you quit looking to Christ. Pray for them. Now, I'm not going to say fellowship with them. What is it, Pastor Tom? Bad company corrupts good morals. Yeah, it hurts. There is a difference between a backslider and a way of Cain person, by the way. Backsliders, a lot of times, they'll, they'll go into, get caught in their sin, and they'll go into their sin, but yet in their heart, they still know that Christ is the way. Even though they're trapped by it, and they, they, they quite can't reach that, but in their heart, they know Christ is still the way. A lot of times, Pastor Tom, you probably had some pretty good spiritual conversations as a drunk, right? A lot of drunks have good spiritual conversations, Because there's still in their heart that yearning, that knowing that what they're doing is wrong, but yet they're not willing to make that quite that choice yet. Now, a way of Cain person is totally hard to that. They mock God. You know, God, mock him. Mock him. Ah, that's, you know, that's a bunch of baloney. Yeah. You know, you're just brainwashed. You're just this. You're just that. Now, I'm not talking about an unsaved person. I'm talking about somebody who's been in Christ and has gone back and rejected Christ. Scripture warns against that, that that type of person actually tramples the blood of Christ underfoot. And there's no more forgiveness for them. Now, don't you be the judge and say, oh, there goes a Cain person. No forgiveness for them. We don't know that. (laughs) Okay? Never, never judge somebody. Never put anybody into hell. You don't have to worry about that, okay? That's God's, at the end, the great white throne judgment. He's going to weed them out. Just pray that you're not one of them that gets weeded out. Stay true to him. Stay focused on him. Stay loving him. Now, I know this is not like a hallelujah. This is great. This is exciting. But this is a warning. Because in the end times, it talks about there's going to be a lot of deceit. There's going to be a lot of deception. There's going to be a lot of false prophets. And the way of Cain has always been in the church. Because there are people, religions now, they get together, but they don't preach the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They're just a religion. That's the way of Cain. Rejecting what God has done. Rejecting the way to heaven. See, the way of Cain, the way of Balaam, the way of Korah, there's also another way. Jesus said it this way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the way. Make sure you're on his way. Amen? Now, Scripture tells us in Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 26, talks about deliberately sinning. There's no more forgiveness of sin. But it also talks about Abel. Jesus quoted this verse. He said, you have killed, Hebrews 11, 4, by faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain, by faith, he was commended righteousness when God spoke well of his heart. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. And then Christ quoted, he said, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, you have killed the prophets. You know what Jesus was saying? Abel was the first prophet. What do you mean? He didn't write a book. He didn't preach a bunch of messages. No, but his life prophesied Jesus Christ. By believing and sacrificing the way God told him to do it, and his life eventually was taken because he did it God's way, his blood still speaks today 
of Jesus Christ. It pointed forward. He was the first prophet. He was the one that said, do it God's way. Just by living his life the way God wanted him to live it. Not necessarily standing on a street corner and preaching. Not necessarily behind a pulpit preaching. Just living your life the way God wants you to live your life. You can be like Abel. You can speak. You can be a prophet. Yes. For God. Think of it. The first one to say, I'm willing to die. Because I'm going to do it God's way. Now Jesus tells us also, you know, look what happened to Abel, but they, they persecute me. They're going to persecute you. The way of Abel is one of sacrifice. And it could cost you your life one day. And we got to be ready for it. And how do you get ready for that? You live your life according to God's word. Don't walk in the way of Cain in areas and say, well, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it my way. Because guess what? When it comes to time for the ultimate sacrifice, you're probably not going to make it. Because you'll say, I'll take the easy way. The way of Cain. Or the way of Balaam. I'm going to scooch around this. You know, we have no idea in this country what it means to really sacrifice for Christ. But there are people in the world today, you know, we've heard it, they're dying. They're literally dying for their faith. And all they have to do is say, no, I don't believe in Jesus. Makes it hard to believe that people would turn away from Christ in a country like this with no persecution just to live their own life when it's really not that hard. I mean, it's hard in ways that we have to die to ourselves. But we're really not getting a lot of pressure from the outside yet. No. But it's going to come. It's got to. It's got to come one day. Or, guess what? We'll end on this note. Or, the trumpet will sound. Y'all know that verse? The trumpet will sound and what? Hello? Who? The dead in Christ will rise and what? First, yeah. And? And we who are alive will what? Will be caught up in the air with them to be with Christ forever. Amen? Amen? The only way you're going to have that, though, is by doing the way of Abel. Trust in Jesus Christ. Trust in what he has done. Trust in his blood. Trust in all the provision that is there. Because there is a lot of provision there. And next week, Lord willing, we're going to talk about the provisions of what that blood has done for us. Kind of remind us a little bit and stand on it. You know, I don't know about you, but there's times I plead the blood He said, Lord, I plead your blood over my life. I plead your blood over this circumstance. I plead your blood over this situation. Because everything's wrapped up in that. All the provision is there. Amen? So what way are we going to follow? The way of Christ, the truth, the life, and the way. Let's stand together this morning. And life is choices every day. We make a choice. God's way or Cain's way. God's way or Balaam's way. God's way or Korah's way. There's only one way, Jesus. Lord, we stand here this morning. And I lift my hand to you this morning again, reaffirming I choose your way. I choose your life. I choose what you have done. I choose your word. It is true. I believe it. I do my best to live by it. By your spirit, help me. We choose your way this morning as a church, as individuals, so that we might glorify you. 
Prepare our hearts, Father, for what is coming in the future. Lord, whatever it might be, we want to be like Job of old. No matter what, though you slay me, yet I will serve you. Have a heart that is totally sold out to you, God. Totally loving you. That we may instantly see if somebody's trying to take us the way of Cain. When we're on your way, we're able to identify the false. Give us ears to hear and hearts to see and receive from you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless. Go in the power and the blessings of the Lord. Because the word says you are blessed in your coming and going. You're rising up. You're sitting down. Whatever you put your hand to do this week, you are blessed. Amen. God bless.